This Week in Startups is brought to you by Mixmax, the number one Gmail-based productivity application that declutters your email, prioritizes tasks, and automates your day. Go to get.mixmax.com slash twist for $100 in credits. DigitalOcean, providing the easiest cloud platform to deploy, manage, and scale applications. Sign up today and receive a free $100 credit at do.co slash twist. And LinkedIn. LinkedIn has marketing tools to help you target your customers with precision. To redeem a $100 LinkedIn ad credit and launch your first campaign, go to linkedin.com slash thisweekinstartups. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. It's another episode of This Week in Startups. We do the show twice a week. We've been doing so for 900 episodes and 10 years. It's my great joy in life to sit down with smart people and talk about the future of technology, entrepreneurship. And today, you're in for a huge treat. One of the things I've noticed is the more successful in life people become, the less they are candid and honest. And in fact, the less they talk. It's a negative correlation, as they say. More success equals less outspoken. And my next guest, Keith Raboy, is one of the most considered thoughtful uh, and brave and honest thinking people I know. And we're not like close friends or anything, but we spend time on social together, which makes it, I feel closer to you than we are. I don't (laughs) think you and I have ever had dinner one-on-one. Nope. Lunch, nothing. Nope. But I feel very close to you in some way. I know that's a little bit weird, but I think social media actually works sometimes. Yeah, it works sometimes. And it's fortunate, I guess, because also you're a Knicks fan, so you're commiserating with me all the time. Oh, God, that poor Zingas trade. <laughs> I literally woke up. I see that as I'm at the Upfront Summit, Mark Seuss's event. And for the first time, I opened up Twitter and actually felt like I was going to throw up. Yep. I mean, it's, it's, it's nonsensical. The, yeah, the the whole Knicks franchise has been screwed up since 2000, really. So like, and you forget like how old we are, but you know, it's like 20 years. So there's it's now been like two years. generations of kids like are used to like the Knicks just being a laughing stock, and it's like yeah, it's horrible since like yeah. realistically 2000 to 2001. When you and I were in New York, going to games where Patrick Ewing, Charles Oakley, Anthony Mason, John Starks, Derek Harper, then the Charles B. Sprewell. Alan Houston, Larry Johnson. I mean, these the garden felt like the roof was going to come off. Oh, yeah. The garden was like the epicenter of New York City. When the Knicks are doing well, it becomes like the center of the cultural center of the city, realistically. And, you know, there's a little true brief moment in the 80s, Bernard King, before yes. Bernard got injured. Um, same thing, you yeah. know, the excitement around the Knicks. But, you know, without an ownership change, I don't think that franchise is ever, you know, realistically going to improve. Right. And I was thinking about retiring. You must have these thoughts sometimes, too, about retiring because you're successful. Sure. And I'm sitting there and I'm thinking about this, like, hey, Uber IPO is coming. I just hit my seventh unicorn with Calm.com, the meditation app. Maybe I should retire. And then I just thought, no. You know what? I read that Mike Ovitz book. Yeah. Which you read too. We were talking about that. And I said to myself, Mike Ovitz built, he just changed the game, right? He built an empire. I'm going to try to do that in like my early stage investing. And I started calculating. Chamath was making fun of me, uh, our mutual friend. I don't know if you're friends with Chamath or not. Yeah, definitely. And He's like, oh, owning a team, you know, it's like the most expensive franchise. And I'm just like, $4 billion, let me work backwards. 13 more unicorns, got to double my stake in each, got to double my, four, I got to quadruple my participation in my own funds. Yep. And it's actually possible. It is, although you still have an owner that has to want to sell. Like you can't buy something that's not for sale. Um, so that's part of the problem too. Yeah. I think, yeah, I was thinking about that as well. I'm trying to figure out my strategy to befriend Dolan and make it seem like it's his idea and that he wants me involved. That sounds like a good idea to me. As opposed to going in and be like, fire Dolan, he sucks. It's like, you know, Jim did the best job he could given the (laughs) circumstances, a little bit of bad luck in there. Alan Houston's knees, Amari's out of knees. I'm just making this up, (laughs) (laughs) but maybe. Let's talk about this Ovitz book. Yes. What did you think of it? What was your main takeaway from who is Mike Ovitz? So I loved reading the book. I've known Michael a little bit over the years. Um, so it's great to read the whole story. I'm not as much of a cinema buff as you, but kind of an amateur, you know, sort of interest in the, in, in the history of the industry. So that part was interesting. But the takeaway from like sort of an entrepreneurial perspective and a VC perspective was the line between success and failure and how thin it is. So one of the things that's incredibly compelling about the book is when he tells the stories behind very successful, very famous movies and how they barely got made and how much heroic effort by both him, 
his you know his business CAA and certain directors, producers, actors, writers that actually made these epic movies, and how most of them really shouldn't have been made or wasn't weren't going to be made, and went through years of purgatory, and that felt a lot like startups. That yeah. it's only the heroic efforts of a handful of individuals that make the difference in creating these companies that we now think of, you know, sort of. God given, and of course the world's going to have, but like movies, and these are most of the most famous movies over the last fifty Rain years. Rain Man, Jurassic Park, the yeah, Tootsie. these were all incredibly controversial that nobody wanted to make, mm. and that he had to through like just sheer tenacity put together and pulled together, yeah. and that was the most impressive sort of takeaway from the book because I didn't really know that history very well and hadn't realized how similar the movie production business is to our business. Yeah, the thing I liked about it too was this trying to think about the structure of how the agencies worked and their role in the ecosystems. And this must not have been lost on you either because we've both been on both sides of the table as founders and investors. And he really thought, oh, when I worked at this other agency, it was every man or woman for themselves. And then he said, no, CAA is going to be a team and we are going to so overperform for every client. And then not only are we going to overperform, we're all going to be working as one for the clients. We're going to bundle our clients together. And so they know like, hey, listen, Jurassic Park is Spielberg plus Crichton. Yep. You know, Dustin Hoffman plus Barry Levinson. What's your takeaway with that in terms of analogous to our industry? Did you did you start thinking about that like I did? Yeah, I did. Uh, absolutely. In fact, I was debating this with um, sort of a VP of people um, last Friday over coffee who kind of came from the movie industry originally before we moved out here. And whether it was possible to sort of monopolize talent in the way CAA did. So, you know, we always have this adage at Coastal Ventures, the team you build is the company you build. Or if you think about the PayPal, my friends at PayPal, why were we successful? We were able to marshal a critical density of talent in one building Hmm. and, you know, sustain it for a period of time. And that's extremely difficult to do. So I've been debating how would one monopolize talent? And could you do that in some unique way where you're packaging talent together? When a VC does his or her job really well, in some ways they're doing that already. So what I'm often doing when I'm getting involved in a company is helping founders recognize where the missing gaps sort of in their DNA versus their vision are. And they may not have the network that has the superbly talented people. So for example, if you're an early stage engineer and you need a finance guru, you may not know someone who's a CFO. Yeah. I know lots of CFOs. I've interviewed tons of CFOs. I've worked with lots of CFOs. So a critical success factor for a company is a CFO or a general counsel. I have that network and I can help evaluate people and bridge that gap. But maybe there's a way to do that at scale, sort of like almost like co-founding a company where you take what's given in a vision and then you're helping improve the odds of success by matchmaking, just like the movies. When you're packaging talent, what they're doing is basically increasing the odds of the movies of Blockbuster by putting the right writers, the right directors, and the right uh, cast together together. The chance of success is very, it's almost preordained. And I think that's true of startups. People talk typically that startups fail or succeed one to 10% of the time. You, know, you can use different metrics. Sure. I actually think if you put together the right founding team, it's more like a 35 to 40% chance of success. Yeah. And that's a big delta. And that's only just a function of getting the right people involved at the right time. And it's, I think a good VC can help do that. Yeah. It's like five to 10 times better odds yes. when you think about it. And then if you think about that, who, is going to help you do that. This whole anti-venture capital meme that's going on. I don't know if you saw this ridiculous story in the New York Times about zebras and about founders who don't want venture capital and venture capital firms that don't want outlier success. And I was trying to figure that out. And I was like, well, that's great, Bryce. If you want to not have unicorns, can you send me the unicorns? And then I'll agree to send you the people who don't want to yeah, that's a fair build tra- unicorns. That's a pretty fair trade. I feel absolutely. like that's a pretty good trade. <laughs> yeah, no, I would take that trade all day long. I like, I actually like Bryce and I like what he's doing, but I, I would take that trade all day long, partially because I have a filter and we at Coastal Ventures have a filter on impact. And roughly speaking, the impact in society is highly correlated with the economic success of the company. And so if you're if you're aspiring to change the world, by definition, you're kind of funding and looking for unicorns. Right. Uh, so I kind of really want to work to change the world. And if I'm working to change the world, by definition, I need companies that have that scale. Yeah. And that scale produces economic value usually. It's kind of interesting. You have this like blitz scaling, go big, change the world contingent. And now you have this anti- venture blitzkrieg kind of thing. And I'm wondering, I I actually think I've seen this before. And like in web 1.0 and many times over this last 30 years that I've been in the business, I think we've been in the business both since the 90s, since the web happened, 
it feels like they're just cyclical. Like people are just like, you know, it got too big. There's too much bad behavior on the edges, whatever. They just take like the Theranos example or Facebook's worst year or Uber's worst year and they just sort of paint that brush. But isn't haven't hasn't Silicon Valley built the perfect machine to create wealth and game-changing companies and products? Like, is there something wrong with the machine we've created here? I don't yeah. see it. No, well, the machine by any standards in human history is like amazing, whether it's perfect or not, right? You can always get better. There can be another generation that's even better than the generation that came before, but no one's ever seen an economic machine that transforms the world almost always positively um, and, you know, actually reinvents industries from scratch. I mean, imagine Tesla, right? So Elon has built by any metric, the best car on the planet, like any consumer reports, any evaluation says yeah. it's the best car ever built, built it from scratch with a bunch of people that had no experience and has actually beat every other auto manufacturer that's been around yeah. forever. Um, and we do that every day. Like literally every day we fund it's kind people. of table stakes. It's the expectation yeah. in a way. Yeah. Now it's hard and it, you know, doesn't always work. And it's, you know, incre it takes incredible dedication, talent, ambition, and sacrifice actually to succeed. But we take it as a given that in any industry, whether it's insurance, financial services, automotive, uh, I think SpaceX, rockets, you know, interplanetary travel, whatever the case is, that that's going to happen. And it's just finding the right opportunities and the right people. But what does happen is when the market gets hot in Silicon Valley, people fragment and start their own companies a little bit too much. And their availability capital, capital propels this. So it's more difficult to assembled and marshal the critical density of talent I was talking which about. Which we were talking about before, right. with, which is what, what uh, made PayPal Ovis was doing. What made, what, what made Michael successful was the ability to do that in Hollywood. And what made PayPal successful was the ability for at least a place and time for us to do that in Palo Alto and Mountain View. And the companies that really succeed become this magnet for talent, and they're able to sustain it for a, a significant period of time. But if too many people fragment, it creates an, almost like an artificially low number of super successful, important companies. Yeah. So to some extent, it's actually easier to be successful when the macro market cools down a bit, because your ability to get talent in one place and keep it in one place is actually improved. Yeah. And so it's it would be almost like if in the Hollywood metaphor... If all of a sudden Spielberg's like, I'm going to write my own screenplays and Crichton's like, I'm going to start directing. It's like, well, it would be better if you guys worked together, together. and kept that talent base together. And if you look at the Warriors. Yes, the Warriors are a good sports example of this. Yeah. Like they've actually been able to keep, I went to, I sat courtside at the game uh, just the other day and I was just watching this game versus the Spurs and I looked at it, it's like five all-stars are on the court at the same time. Steph Clay, Draymond. Kevin Durant, and then they put Boogie in there. It's just, it was just bizarre to watch. And they scored, I think, 25 baskets in a row or something ridiculous. And you're just watching it going, God, this is such a moment in time. Yeah, it's very rare, especially when you have this artificial constraint of a salary cap, which mm -hmm. doesn't apply as much in the business world. Um, it's designed to sort of spread and create more mediocrity. Uh, by definition, that's what a salary cap like is designed to do. It can be can cheat at the edges and be brilliant at the edges as the Warriors have been. But in the startup world, like you don't have that artificial constraint. You could actually monopolize talent. And that's mo one of my goals in life. Speaking of uh, Michael Ovitz is I've always joked with my friends about one day I want to figure out how to monopolize talent. Yeah. I haven't quite figured that one out yet. A cap table that can fit everybody. A salary <laughs> cap. A ball that can be shot by five people concurrently. I mean, it's like there's only one ball. Yeah, it's very difficult to do. Um, I and in and, and figure out how to scale it too, like generationally, like right, people get older and you want to find up and coming, undiscovered talent, like you would sure. draft people out of high school in basketball and how to do that in a scalable way. I'd love to all figure out how to put this all together before I quit this job. <laughs> <laughs> when we get back after this break, uh, we're gonna talk about socialism, Trump. Tio, Elon, and then hustle and balance. We're gonna all do the little, easy questions. I'm going to just give you all the word. We're going to do like word association. Like this is a therapy session. I'm going to be like, Trump, you speak. There's going to be a lot of people triggered with this. <laughs> it's hashtag tr trigger warning. I'm going to add trigger warnings and identity <laughs> politics to the list. But I told you from the beginning, he's candid, he's thoughtful, and it's going to be a great discussion when we get back on This Week in Startups. My sales team is obsessed with MixMax, M-I-X-M-A-X. It's a Gmail-based productivity application, and it provides massively powerful campaign analytics, and it supercharges your efficiency in really three areas, sales, outbound sales engagement, automation, and analytics for bringing in new business. Wouldn't 70% open rates and 50 to 60 
percent reply rates be great for your startup, for your sales team? We'll go ask them. And many customer success teams do not have a one-to-one relationship with customers. That's what you want. Recruitment as well, scheduling, availability, it keeps you super busy. Well, imagine you get an email that says, pick one of these dates, boom, or vote on which one of these dates you want. Thumbtack sales teams uses it, and so does their HR team, and they love it. Our sales team loves it, and Grant from my team said their sales efficiency and effectiveness has taken off since switching to Mix Max. They love it. Through simple email sequencing and automation, they've achieved absurdly good results. I mean, ridiculous. 91% open rates, 20% click rates, 30% reply rates, 10% outbound emails to meeting conversion. That's the key. You want to get those emails to conversions going. And one out of every 10 cold emails converts into a meeting now. And we're tracking all this. This is the pipeline management. And this is the sequencing that high-end sales teams are doing. Well, it's available for everybody with MixMax. So I want you to go to get.mixmax.com slash twist. Get dot mix max dot com slash twist t-w-i-s-t and you're going to get a hundred dollars a c-note a hundy in credits with a minimum of three annual licenses there's no strings attached no credit card required to get a demo uh, and it's great for your sales team it's great for executives recruitment customer success all of that so start tracking get dot mix max dot com slash twist you're going to love this product okay let's get back to this amazing episode Hey, everybody. Welcome back to This Week in Startups. Keith Raboy is with us. You can follow him on the Twitter, R-A-B-O-I-S, Raboy. That's it. Easy yep. to pronounce. Um, and he is a partner of our Coastal Ventures. Uh, he started Open Door. Correct. Which is brilliant. And we, t- we, talked we talked about, about, about that, that a few years ago. A few years ago. And if I remember correctly, the concept was, I tell you, this is my home. You give me a price and give me my money now. Yep. Then on the other side, if people want to buy it, you tell them, go to the house anytime you want. Here's the code. There's cameras in there, just so you know. Don't like Exactly. Me. So we talked about this a couple of years ago. What we, happened in the last just, four years? Yes, we just launched. We had just launched the company when we talked about it probably summer of 2016. We were in two markets, Phoenix and Dallas. We're now in 18 markets in the US. Wow. Uh, so last year in 2008, we went to all 18 markets. This year, we're going to go to at least 30 markets. So it's basically available pretty soon almost everywhere, wow. except the Bay Area. The Bay Area is a little bit anomalous in terms of real estate Weird. prices and days on market and a variety of issues. But basically what we provide is instant liquidity for your house. So if you want to sell your house, we make it pain-free, friction-free. You can go to the website, give us your address. We'll give you an offer. If you like it, you can have your money in three days. Wow. And then you can decide when you want to move out. Um, so it makes it as easy as trading in your car, which is the original vision. And you know, now that we're in 18 markets, we're doing this everywhere. It works everywhere. It's really resonating. Yeah. What's the scale of it? How many homes have you bought and sold? Or, or just bought, I guess. Let's just well, put it that way. Is it thousands, hundreds or thousands? Thousands and thousands. I mean, like wow. this year, we'll probably buy $10 billion worth of homes this year. Um, so that's a rough... Wow, scale. $10 billion in homes. So let's talk about You want to buy some? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we well, actually, too. it's interesting. Like when you hold them, yep. what have you learned about buying so many homes uh, that you didn't know going in? The buying part, I think we got right. Like I had this vision back in 2003 that really gener- that, that really was the genesis of the company. That part, I think we got right, which is that the thesis was that you could use data to model a home sight unseen accurately enough to purchase it safely. And we were right about that. I think we learned more about selling a house, um, that there's a lot of operational complexity in selling a house. It's a little Such bit as? like- it's a, Well, it's like more like Instacart or DoorDash or in some ways Uber or Lyft. You have people on the street that are selling a house. Like, mm. So you have people like making sure that the grass is uh, cut or the pool is clean. Yeah. And there's a lot of operational complexity that you need to be masters at or you can lose a lot of money. So DoorDash is very successful. Instacart is very successful because they figured out how to deliver food on time in an affordable way consistently. Yeah, That's very difficult to do at scale. And ho- selling homes and maintaining homes yeah. has some of those characteristics. The buying part is actually a lot easier, at least for us. Yeah, you just know the square footage, you know the location, you have the comps, you have all that. But on the other side, there's an emotional uh, thing that happens when people walk on a property and say, I'm going to spend a decade or two here, raise my kids here. That's true. That's a good insight. Uh, I think the decision to sell a house is more utilitarian. Yeah. So how easy is it going to be? How convenient and how certain am I about this? And is the price fair? And once you have that all locked and loaded and know how to do that reliably, 
it's a pretty just rational decision. The purchase of a home can be very emotional, which has a lot of different flavors to it than just purely, is this the right size for my family? Is this the right vibe? You know, and that there's a lot of soft variables there that you have to get very good at. Yeah. Like the schools are one thing that is quantifiable, right? Sure. So yeah, there's you know, like, sources that tell you about the quality of the local school district. Yeah, but no, when you buy it, that's why they're constantly like when your state, now that I've bought a, sold a couple of homes, that like the staging and how people perceive their life in there. So like this room is where you're going to play poker. Yep. And then this is your man cave and this is your theater and this is your yoga room. I'm like- Anybody really have a yoga room? Anybody really have a massage room in their house? Like, I mean, come on. But they set them up in the staging. Like, this is your. This could be a fifth bedroom or a fourth bedroom, but it's really a massage. It's room. aspirational, right? Yeah. So, like, you're. It's a little bit of sex appeal. It's like merchandising, right? Yeah. Like, you go to a department store, and part of what they're doing when they're really good at what they're doing uh, is merchandising. You discover things, and you kind of want to be a certain way, and that's part of buying a home and we've gotten much more proficient at it, but there's a lot of learnings there that we didn't know when we started the company. Yeah. And so you got to figure that part out, the sales part. But we're we're good at it now. I mean, we sell our homes faster than on average. Like, so we use a benchmark of how fast does a home turnover in the market and we should be better at it than the average real estate agent, but it's hard. There's no doubt it's challenging. Interesting. What do you think of this hustle It doesn't have anti hustle. It doesn't have to be crazy at work meme that's going around. So there's a group of people. You and I are both Gen Xers. (laughs) uh, And we came in after the boomers, and it was kind of like, hey, we're going to have to bust our asses to, you know, actually create our own world. Now you have this millennial and Gen Z, and it's kind of this like lifestyle experiences first. That's quite charming. But does it have to be crazy at work? Do you have to hustle? Can you build a Tesla or a Facebook and not sacrifice a large um, swath of your time and life in that pursuit? Well, so there's two answers to that question. One is you don't have to sacrifice everything, but it depends what your ambition in life is. There are a lot of people who want to change the world. There are some people who want to build the next Tesla, Facebook, a better Facebook, whatever. Those tend to be incredibly difficult exercises. There's people who want to be NBA basketball players and there's people who want to be high school basketball players. If you want to play you know, on the NBA all-star team, you're probably committing a lot of your time to practice. Mm. You're probably working out. You're probably eating well. You're sleeping. You're, and you're taking 500 shots a day, typically. Wow. 500 shots a day is incredibly draining. Um, 100 shots a day for me is incredibly draining. But like, if you want to be- And monotonous. Gy- yeah. And if you're like, imagine you want to be an Olympic gymnast from the time you're like four years old, you do nothing except train for the Olympics. And so it depends what your goals in life are. But the idea that there's no sacrifice or no trade-offs is crazy. Um, if you want to do unreasonable things, and most of these goals are unreasonable by any normal definition- There's unreasonable commitments and sacrifices that come with that. And it's up to any individual what they want to do with their life, you know, whether they value X versus Y. But but to tell people that they can achieve without the sacrifice is just misleading and borderline fraudulent. Why is it that people are holding billionaires and successful people in contempt at this moment? There was Farhad in um, the New York Times wrote this ridiculous story about like we got to ban billionaires. I started thinking about that and I was like, wow, isn't the whole entire American dream predicated on there is no cap to the success? Like, and isn't that what makes us punch above our weight on the global stage with only 330 million people? We're the dominant force, even as effed up as Trump and everything is right now. And why is this happening right now that everybody doesn't believe in the American dream when the Amer- America's never had better employment, never had better productivity, and the standard of living is better for everybody objectively. It's very weird to me. It is a weird dynamic. Um, so I, I'm not sure how popular that dynamic is versus like it, the people who have a, uh, sort of an amplified microphone tend to ah. disproportionately share it. So, so I, you know, I think the American dream is still very aspirational for most Americans. I think that billionaires are people and successful people in any field are people we should emulate. So my my belief in life is that if you want to be more like a successful person, you should copy their traits. Hmm. And so if you want to be a successful company, you copy the traits of successful companies, not failed companies. And if you want to succeed in life, you copy the traits back to the days of Ben Franklin. I mean, like Ben Franklin was like, you get up early, you yeah. know, <laughs> you know, like this stuff. There, I think also there's not a lot of secrets, meaning like 
the keys to success aren't secret, just they're painful. So you have deferred gratification versus immediate gratification. So let me give you a mundane example to start. Let's say someone wanted to be, for whatever set of reasons, a cover model for men's health. Got it. With the right diet and the right program and the right sleep, most people can achieve that. It may take years of training, but the gratification comes after the years and the sacrifice comes up front. Right. Same thing these days, if you wanted to, as you know, we're both getting older, if you wanted to live five to 10 years longer, there's a pretty reasonably proven methodology for doing that, which is intermittent fasting, severe caloric restriction. There's a lot of evidence that that would extend your lifespan, not yeah. forever, but for five to 10 years. Yeah. And the you'll problem, have a higher quality of life. Higher quality of life while you're active, like you have more quality years actually. Yeah. Now that said, you have to restrict your calories to 1200 calories and that sucks. you have to do that for years to get the benefit. Right. So I think most of life is, can you trade gratification, long-term gratification for short-term sacrifice? And can you compress the feedback loop? And that's a you know, product feature level is just compress the feedback loop, allows more people to stay on the program right. and not churn and you know go back to regress their behavior. But it, so I think like there is a formula for most success but it entails trading off short-term and long-term gratification. And you just have to decide where on that dollar you want to be. Yeah. Silicon Valley, is it a meritocracy? Well, it's more meritocratic than any other industry in America. Um, I worked in law and in politics professionally. And as a result of representing other industries as a lawyer, certainly had exposure to the financial services industry, which a lot of our clients, aviation industry, which a lot of my clients, um, by far more meritocratic. And the, the definition of meritocratic would be, can you go from like literally nowhere to success overnight? And the answer is absolutely yes. I mean, one of the most interesting things about Silicon Valley is you meet people very early in their career sometimes, and you know you wake up a couple years later and they're more successful than you. A magnitude more. <laughs> oh yeah, I mean, I I have former interns of mine that are like super successful. Um, and you know, they, does they it crush your soul or does it inspire you? No, it's very inspiring. It's yeah. it's inspiring in a couple dimensions. It actually makes me more ambitious and and, and challenges me to be better at my own job and performance. Be it it gives me um, energy to help people earlier in their career. Like if I can teach or mentor a couple of things that allows them to accelerate their own learnings, you can see the benefit of that where yeah. they, they go farther and faster. Yeah. It's interesting to me as well because it seems like this is the most helpful industry I've ever met as well. There is like this really, I mean, beautiful tradition here of helping people who are new uh, to the industry. And it, it also makes me wonder why the industry has kind of got this rap of like not being a meritocracy, being an old boys club, and like that you, you have to know somebody to make it here. It's like- We didn't know anybody at PayPal. I keep pointing this out. We were a bunch of misfits that had no pre-existing Oh, were you ever? Oh, okay. yeah. I mean, you should- I know some, your friends. Yeah. <laughs> I'm good friends <laughs> you know, with- You know David Peter or whatever, Max. Everybody. Um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Jeremy, oh David, my God, everybody. Yeah. Everybody was a misfit. And, you know, even the media picked up on that. There was like cover stories in magazines about Earth to PayPal because we yeah. were that different. Yeah. And we made our own network and we made our own success and then we rebuilt a network ourselves, but we didn't have any connections. And then, you know, I've seen like ridiculous books written that say, oh, well, we went, some of us went to Stanford. Actually, truthfully, less than half the company went to Stanford. Most went to the University of Illinois, which is a large state school in the middle of America. Yeah. Um, that's where all the engineers came from. None of them came from Stanford. Okay. Uh, secondly, you know, and there's 40,000, I think, graduates or 40,000 students at the University of Illinois at any given time. Only one of them was Max. Right. You know, so like the idea that like that was some advantage or Stanford, you know, there's 6,000 undergrads at a time. Yeah. Peter created PayPal. Yeah. <laughs> Not the other 5,999. So the right. idea that like Stanford's some major advantage is just ridiculous um, with the math being one to five. 5,999. Yeah. Um, so I think people make their own um, sort of success. And Silicon Valley welcomes that. I mean, you look at the immigrant stats. There's all these different ways to cut the data. But at the end of the day, almost every important um, Silicon Valley company in the last 50 years had at least one founder that was a first generation yeah, I mean, immigrant. Elon, Steve Jobs, oh, yeah. David Sachs. Oh, I right. mean, none of these people were- The entire, everybody immigrated from India. I mean, like- you have Korea, you have a bunch of refugees from communist countries. Yeah. You know, we had the stat, the, the Sergey, famous PayPal stat of, uh, you know, half the founders of PayPal built bombs in high school. Um, oh boy, and, yeah. 
They did, but you have to remember, like most of them were building bombs in communist countries, which is probably a reasonable <laughs> thing to be doing. Freedom fighters, not <laughs> yes, terrorists. Exactly. <laughs> uh, all right. When we get back, God, I, I don't know if I want to go there, but the Trump phenomenon is relevant in, in your friendship to Peter. That's one. And then there's also this Khashoggi, Saudi Arabia involvement in America and China. And all of this is really, for some reason, landing in Silicon Valley as much or more than in Washington, D.C. So we're going to talk about those uh, non-controversial, just easy breezy topics when we get back with Keith Raboy on This Week in Startups. You know what you need for your startup. You need to scale your infrastructure to match all your explosive growth. Well, if you want the best cloud platform to deploy, manage, and scale applications, that is DigitalOcean. 150,000 businesses are using DigitalOcean, over 150,000, and they are one of Inc.'s world's fastest growing startups. You get free round the clock tech support for all of the customers that use the service, regardless of the spend. And there's a huge learning community with resources and tutorials ready to go. It's business ready and it's here, ready to scale with you. Very straightforward billing. You're always going to know what you'll pay. Get a hundy, a hundred dollars right now by going to do.co slash twist. Yes, go to do.co slash twist. They got the nice short domain name. And here is an amazing customer testimonial. Listen to this, everybody. Since moving to DigitalOcean, our setup is ultimately more capable than what we had before the migration. Downtime has become a rarity and our hosting costs have decreased by more than 90%. What? You're gonna save a ton of money, you're gonna get better service, and you're going to love how easy and simple it is to use. DigitalOcean, an amazing company. Uh, we've had Mitch Weiner on the program a couple of times. Great guy, great company, great founders. They raised a ton of money and they are building the world's greatest cloud platform. So go ahead and get that hundy right now by going to do.co slash twist. Go ahead and get that $100. That offer may not last. So I need you to do it right now today. Do.co slash twist. Okay, let's get back to this amazing episode. All right, welcome back. Keith Raboy is with us, um, CEO of Square, worked on Slide back in the day, LinkedIn, PayPal. What a career. Uh, you know, I was just thinking about the funny thing. We were, we were talking about the meritocracy, but it was, those are all our men. So there was a female founder issue in this town for a long time. That seems to have changed radically in the last five years. I've invested in 10 times as many women in the last five years and seen 20 times, 30 times more female founders. It feels like we've made progress there, yeah? Yeah, I mean, I, I would love to see actual stats. I mean, unfortunately, like I've looked at our own internal stats. We don't, we haven't gone back over the years, tracked everything in a way that makes it easy to parse everything. But my impression has been that the female founders that have pitched us have received term sheets at a higher rate, actually, yeah. than the average male founder that pitches us. Certainly, at the ones who make it to the partnership meeting stage, absolutely, our propensity to extend a term sheet is higher. Hmm. Um, but, do you have a theory on that? Because I do, but I want to hear yours. <laughs> um, no, I do think that there is um, – Absolutely, there's a desire to fund people from you know a variety of different backgrounds, and so people that, here are working on equality issues, absolutely. and they're tuned into it in they're a very, major way. Oh, absolutely, people are very attuned to it, yeah. um, and have been, which least, is a good thing. I, I've only been a VC for six years now, um, and certainly been true. I think all six years I've been for in sure. yeah. Um I don't have as much context. You know, the 13 years I was like running stuff, I was an active angel investor, but I wasn't really tracking like what venture capitalists did and what they funded. And so I, I can't opine as accurately, but in the six years I've witnessed, I think there's a significant uh, receptivity to fun finding, identifying and funding and mentoring people with different backgrounds. Yeah. People were underrepresented. Yeah. And, and, and there's different dimensions to underrepresented, you know, like uh, we have actually like a COSLA, even though we don't have a female partner, which occasionally, you know, people point out, we actually don't have a establishment white male either partner. No, we don't have, white male. We don't have one. We don't have one Christian white male partner, like from the U.S. We don't have yeah, one American yeah. Christian white male partner. It's crazy. I know. I got. I got. I got looped into that. They were. They were when they were looking for partners when they formed it. I got a little phone call from an executive search firm. I was like, I'm a cis white male. They're like. We're looking for one, but you don't make the cut. Yeah, we, have, we literally don't have one central casting American Christian. 
Wow. Hmm. Yeah, it's the end of the line. They were like, we're obviously discriminating. <laughs> my, uh, my thesis on this is when I meet female founders, I think there's a lot of dipshit guys who are not qualified to be founders who will fight their way to get that meeting. So like they figure out a way to get to me and then I meet them and I'm so unimpressed. So in, in aggregate, the average male, white male coming to me is below average, like massively. And then there's such a smaller sample that I think the women who are drawn to be founders and take that seat are so much higher quality and they take the work so much seriously. A lot of these like guy founders I meet, they all want the, speaking about the reward issue you talked about, they want the reward before they've done any work or have any skill. Well, there is definitely it's a like an post, entitlement. There's definitely a post social network, you know, startups being cool phenom where people people move to Silicon Valley or start companies and become founders because it's quote unquote cool. Yeah. And that was something that certainly wasn't true when I when I was kind of growing up, which I would date until about maybe until I was thirty five, maybe forty. Um, the only people who became founders were like weird, like literally weird. Like, in fact, when I was graduating Stanford, the people who became founders were the people who couldn't get a job. Right. Like it was like the myth, the true misfits. Them. Yeah, Goldman, they couldn't get a, a yeah. Goldman job or a McKinsey interview no. and they had no choice but to found a company. And that shifted and then it, you know, the first internet generation shifted it positively, I think. I think the second generation of the internet with like social media and other attention in the mainstream media may have brought what, you know, our friends at Sequoia call the tourists to Silicon Valley. Oh, God, it's a tourist and that, season. And that definitely, you know, has an adverse selection element to it. Yeah. And so I think there's a lot of founders I meet. Hopefully, I can filter them out before I meet them, but, you know, make mistakes that want to be founders and want to start companies because they think it's prestigious or cool versus they want to change the world and really fix problems. And How I think hard is it for you to, ch to check that? And is there like a technique? Is there a question, secret question or something? What are your techniques for filtering? I think that? it is at the margin, not that difficult. I think there are people who are like anything else. There are people who are better and worse at framing things and how much, how, how excellent you are at, you know, reading between the lines varies a lot. And you anybody's going to make mistakes it's like drafting players yeah. in, you know, football or, or, or basketball or baseball, even, even if you're very good at drafting, you're clearly going to have some errors. Yeah. So you definitely make mistakes, but there are, there are ways to tease out motivations um, and values and if you if you do that across a pool of investments, you wind up with a positive skew yeah. of like the right motivations or here for the right reasons or building the company in the right way. Yeah. I ask people, so why are you doing this idea? That often leads to a good, uh, that is a great way to start. Yeah. I do think that there are- they talk and talk and then all of a sudden you're like, wait a second, I'm looking you in the eyes like a poker player and I'm like, I don't think you have it. Yeah. Well, the, the one way, like for example, one way I don't, one thing I don't love is people who become founders in search of an idea. It's like, we're going to start a yeah. company. I'm like, well, what are you going to do? And they're like, we don't know. We're going to spend a couple of months thinking about it. I'm like, yeah. when that, that work? That rarely works. Bezos, um, I think, is the only one that you can point to because I think he was looking for an idea coming out of, was he D.E. Shaw? Yeah, D.E. Shaw. He's like, I need an idea. But then he just felt like, who knows the folklore of these things? But. Yeah, there's a lot of folklore involved. And it's usually a confluence of a couple of things. Like I might want to be a founder and I kind of have this problem and maybe I have this like sleepless night where they come together. Like so for me at Open Door, so Peter really started my process of thinking about real Teal. estate, Peter Thiel, back in 2003. He basically said, come up with an idea that's going to innovate in residential real estate. I said, why? And he said, well, it's the largest part of the US economy that's been unaffected by technology, which was true in 2003 and was also true you know, 2009 or whatever. But fundamentally, he was right. But also what he was right about, or what he didn't know is, or might not have remembered, is when I joined PayPal, which was right after Peter had come back as CEO in uh, September 25th, 2000. Peter came back as interim CEO of PayPal. Um, Peter and I had this negotiation about me joining PayPal. And we went back and forth. We agreed on title and equity compensation and cash compensation. And at the time, I was living on the East Coast, owned a property in Washington, D.C. And Peter basically said, well, so I'll see you on Monday. And I was like, what are we talking about? Like, I thought I could start in two to four weeks. And Peter's like, nope, can't start on Monday. Forget the whole thing. It's <laughs> <laughs> a very like, Peter Thiel moment. Yes, yeah, classic Peter, like totally classic Peter. With, uh, so we we compromised. We I had to start on Tuesday, not Monday. Okay, great. So they gave me Monday to sell my house. Wow. So, you know, in Open Door, the idea of selling your house instantly, it wasn't like that experience was, like, was exactly what predicated the Open Door uh, sort of insight. 
But maybe it wasn't accidental that when Peter was like, start something in real estate, come up with an idea in real estate, the idea of instantly selling your home like occurred to me because I had actually gone through that pain and dealt with it like personally in yeah. having to join PayPal or sacrifice you know, my future. Yeah. All right. When we get back, we'll talk about should Silicon Valley companies take money from Chinese or Saudi investors? Something I've been thinking about a lot because my biggest investment, Uber- Has a lot of money. Took a lot of money. Uh, from in two rounds, what, they took it from the Saudis directly. Then they took it from Masa, who took it from the Saudis. Right, and that didn't sit well with me. But I want to hear your opinion when we get back on this week at startups. We love LinkedIn for marketing and advertising our products here at Launch. Let me show you how we're using it because there's 500 million people every day on LinkedIn. And it's not just for jobs, it's also for marketing. They have an ad platform that is second to none. It lets you do really interesting things, like target people not only by geography, which a lot of people do, candidly, but by job title and what company they're at. So we want people to come to Launch Festival Sydney. You know, we brought uh, the Launch Festival to Sydney, and we started buying some ads in New Zealand, in Australia, obviously. And... We decided we wanted investors, right? Because we do angel investing, angel university. We also found entrepreneurs, sales executives, and startups. And now we've built an ad. We upload a video and target just those people. So here is Presh, our CMO, uh, putting up the ads for Launch Festival Sydney. And we put in the headline, the call to action, learn more. And we figure out, oh, look, there's 330,000 people who matched that very targeted ticket purchaser for our event. And our tickets for our events are, you know, whatever, $300 up to $1,000 maybe. Well, we can easily make that money back by using LinkedIn marketing and reach customers we didn't know were out there. That's the great thing about the ubiquity of LinkedIn, and that's the power of LinkedIn marketing. So here's your call to action. It's unbelievable, I know. But LinkedIn is going to give our audience members 100 bucks, a hundy, a bean, right now. Get that ad credit by going to linkedin.com slash this week in startups. You got to spell it out. LinkedIn.com this week in startups. No spaces, no dashes, no nonsense. LinkedIn.com slash this week in startups. You can create a campaign in minutes and four out of five customers on LinkedIn, they're decision makers just like you. So you're building relationships with people that really matter and you're not wasting your ad spend on people who will never buy your product or service. Okay, go get that hundred. Get that hundy. That hundred is not going to be available forever. I can tell you that. That's a generous offer. LinkedIn.com slash This Week in Startups. Okay, let's get back to this amazing episode. Okay, we're winning so much, winning so much on this episode with Keith Ruboy. Okay? And we're going to build the wall, and Keith Ruboy is going to pay for it. <laughs> you are, people think you're pro Trump because you're, I think, a conservative. I think I'm going to. Try to unpack this here based on your social media. You're anti-Trump. You were never Trump. You're conservative, but libertarian and small government, but solutions-based. So I'm trying to parse you because you're a solutions-based person, but you're conservative and you're a gay man. Yeah, I think I'm a, so I'm definitely conservative and definitely was anti-Trump. I funded, I might have even been the first never Trump funder. Oh, wow. I, think I might have wrote the first check. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, to me, Trump, really was unprepared to be president of the United States, both personally and professionally, and was basically a, border, a borderline sociopath, which I tweeted you know, while he was running for president. And I think that's proven to be accurate. Um, yeah. It doesn't mean he doesn't occasionally stumble into the, a, writer, or a, a better writer, a, a right answer, um, maybe by accident, um, but, or maybe because he's hired some smart people. But fundamentally, yeah, I would not have voted for him. I didn't support him. I was very much opposed to him. And I think he just doesn't have the right demeanor in, in many ways uh, to be an inspiring leader. That said, I think a lot of other people are flawed. Um, and mostly they're flawed because they have bad ideas. Um, so you have maybe better character from some of the candidates he opposed, but their ideas may have been inferior. Um, I sort of kind of compared it to rolling the dice, which is if you were very unhappy about the future of America, rolling the dice with some random candidate might have been a reasonably rational thing to do, which is somewhat what Peter did. It's kind of is, the Ross like, Perot thinking. Like, hey, yeah. let's put somebody different in there. The let's Bloomberg try something different. Thinking. I don't like the current state of affairs. Two I don't like the trajectory system. we're on. Yeah. Let's try something else. It might be better. Right. Hiring I, somebody's son or spouse 
for three or four generations to run the country, it starts to look more like, I don't know, like, um, yeah, royalty. Yeah, so people wanted to roll, a lot of people wanted to roll the dice, and I think they got some of the things they expected and maybe some things they didn't expect. But uh, that's not what I would have done. It's not what I would support. I mean, I kind of an ideological conservative, and by that I mean um, specifically, I tend to believe that there's right and wrong answers in life. I tend to believe that there's a benchmark of merit. I tend to believe that markets and freedom produce better outcomes than a top-down philosophy of how, how to arrange assets. And those things combine into being like a, a proven philosophy. Um, my hero growing up was Margaret Thatcher. Um, I think when when I get depressed, I just re reread a, a, a great Margaret Thatcher speech. I have a collection of her speeches, and they always inspire me. What is um, it about her that makes her well, so inspiring to you? So a couple things. One was the baseline state of affairs that she inherited in Britain was so bad, and Britain was really the sick, you know, considered to be the sick man, quote unquote, of Europe. Mm -hmm. It was a socialist country that was paralyzed by unions that had no economic future and progress, was diminishing an influence in the world. And she overnight changed that just by force of will and force of philosophy. She really understood the ideas that she was supporting and their, you know, historical provenance and her power in expressing them and her relentlessness and tenacity, like a very good founder, she just walked through walls and said, no one's stopping me. Right. Um, she had this great phrase I liked, which is very relevant to today's world, where she said, I don't read the papers, they might deter me. And I think that, you know, immunity from what other people think is what leads people to be un unreasonably successful. I think, you know, per this diversity discussion we had, I think also she was subject to more discrimination um, and more. Britain is still in the UK today, back certainly back then in the 70s and 80s, but even even today is still much more hierarchical um, establishment driven culture. Yeah. And there was a lot of gatekeepers and they tried their best, but she was just so good and so power and so personally powerful that she was able to break through every possible constraint. But the revenge when she basically got fired and dumped by her own party was a function of alienating these powerful men by refusing to back down mm. to them. So I think it's a great sort of metaphor for how one can succeed in despite discrimination. And I think we'll see that in the United States too. I think the, the first female president here is going to be a conservative. Hopefully it's Nikki Haley. Huh. Um, I think she'd be great. But I, I think you will see that dimension play out here too. It's interesting when you look at Trump because he does have some savant-like ability to communicate, but it, it's, it's not based on intelligence or a thorough understanding of anything apparently. Well, he's got a great marketing instinct. So when we were marketing on marketing would be better when than we were on, we were on stage uh, the summer of 2016. Yeah. I compared Trump to Uber, which actually turned out to be even a better comparison <laughs> yeah. than I realized at the time. Um, but I think Trump like a very strong founder who has great strengths and incredible weaknesses mm. has some great strengths and that's why he was able to beat 17 candidates in the primary and then go back and then go through the general election and beat Hillary is like you clearly can't do that without some skill but his lack of discipline um, creates more unforced errors than any professional it's politician ridiculous. I've seen in my life yeah. um, you know you can imagine how effective and dangerous depending upon your perspective Trump would be if he had a little bit more self-discipline they had yeah. the same ideas same principles, but just was a little bit more disciplined. If he read. Oh my God, would he be dangerous? And and, like, or if he and, surrounded himself with qualified people instead of alienating them and making them leave and write books about what a terrible human he is. Like yeah, he, yeah, no, he definitely- He had a lot of talent in that place, right? He, he could have. I mean, so people forget that, you know, one of the things that A, Lady Thatcher did and certainly President Reagan did before they were elected was read, they were voracious readers. And, you know, people used to dismiss Reagan, not really understanding how much intellectual heft he had. And then after he died, a lot of his handwritten notes and speeches came out, mm -hmm. where it's very clear that the intellectual work product behind his run, his, his gubernatorial campaigns, his successful two terms as governor of California and running for president were really driven by him. It wasn't like you know, a staff thing. And the same thing was true of Lady Thatcher. She was the inspiration and the staff had to keep up with her. And so I think like Trump completely lacks that intellectual heft. Um, mm -hmm. And that that's frustrating because I think there are really good ideas that can solve problems and make America, make the world better. 
but you need to read and you need to find them and you need to decide to prioritize them. It's a little bit like when you're running a startup. You have these random free radicals in your organization that have better ways of doing things. And the traditional organization structure, hierarchical structure is going to filter some of those out. And a really good CEO, though, will look for those free radicals and those great ideas and embrace one or two a year yeah. and use their credibility and social capital to make those radical and innovative ideas happen. Right. And so I think that that's what a- great, Unleash them. Right. Yes. You're unleashing them against this organizational inertia. And yeah. every successful organization has inertia. And what you want is someone who has the intellectual curiosity to go find those and embrace a few and power them through. Right. And that's how you get breakthrough success in a startup or in politics. And I really wish we had a president who would look for those ideas because I think there are solutions to healthcare that people could embrace that could change you know, everything versus like some ridiculous socialized future. Yeah. I, I see that you, the, the trick is to not burn the building down while you're letting those free radicals out because it is a little bit of an experiment, right? You're like, okay, let's let this fire brand out. Like, just don't burn the ship. So I use a football metaphor for this, which is most organizations are proficient at running the ball hmm. and you you optimize for running the ball. Yeah. Like you optimize. And the more skill you have, the more optimization actually gets you success. And yeah, you can three yard it. run. Yeah, four you're yard run. Three and four yards. And you're just so good. Your a offensive lot of first line downs. is just so good. You're just going to move the ball forward. And yeah. if you run the ball forward six times, you're going to wind up in a better place than where you were. So every month and every quarter, you feel like you're making progress. But you really need to be an iconic company. You need to throw some passes and you yeah. throw the ball downfield. Take some risk. And it's sometimes hard to prove to people that this pass stuff, it feels like the 1960s and 70s Ohio State Michigan games, like with Bo Schembecker and Woody Hayes. Like this idea of like throwing the ball downfield like would have seemed foreign and crazy. And yeah. they'd be like, what are these Florida people doing? <laughs> you yeah. know, why are these people like yeah. like trying to do this stuff? And then, but those passes work sometimes. Yeah, and, 30, you know, 40 yards. Yeah. And then 10x result. And all of a sudden, you know, you have a very different, um, you know, ball game really. And you can change the dynamics and the, you can change the skill sets you need. And I, I think a healthy company does a mix of throwing passes downfield and running the ball. And the same thing I think is true in politics. Hmm. Yeah. I, I thought Trump's approach to Kim Jong il un? Yes. Or, il or un? It's un. Kim Jong, who's the latest? Kim Jong, I always get this wrong. Anyway. To North with, Korea. To North Korea. <laughs> I said long before like Trump was even in office, like this kid loves movies and basketball players. Let's invite him to Sundance and the Oscars or the NBA finals if he gives up his nukes. Yep. If he could come to America and go to the All-Star game, sit courtside, like he would do it. Or if we brought Tom Hanks and some movies over there for screenings, yep. like he would, he'd, he'd go for it. He'd fall for it. What did Trump do? Trump's like, I'm going to play to his ego. I'm going to get him out of his shell. Like it, That actually seemed like kind of brilliant to me, yep. that approach. And the China actually standing up to China saying, hey, like we're going to demand some things here in terms of fairness. Like, where's our cars in your country? We got, you know, uh, it seemed like he was getting some things right. I think that's right. I think So like, many things wrong. Well, I think in North, let's talk about North Korea for a second. Yeah. I think in North Korea, the establishment in Washington, D.C. has been ignoring a really severe problem in North Korea since at least the 1990s, arguably since the 1950s. And the problem's been getting worse, not better. Yeah. And Trump, to his credit, said, like, look, every day this is getting worse, not better. So we need to do something different. Just throw a pass. Yep. Yeah. And let's try it. Yeah. And I think it may turn out to be more successful. It's certainly not going to be less successful than the last 40 years of just ignoring the problem. In China, I think you actually see this in Silicon Valley. When I go to dinner with my friends who are more liberal or more representative of the distribution of views in Silicon Valley, about half the people think China uh, Trump is right on China in pushing back. Like I think, again, the foreign policy establishment in Washington is so corrupted by Chinese money and Chinese influence and the potential of the Chinese market that the willingness to take a stand um, has been compromised on both parties. And Trump's willing to push back. And he's more right than wrong on China. And I think he will get most of what he wants mm. um, from China. Because I think China realizes that they're disproportionately exposed to our economy. And they will actually lose more than we will in a, ma in a massive sort of economic war. There are places- In the short term. There are places Apple could build- the next iPhone that are not China. Yep. <laughs> and that would not be good for China. No, and, and the Chinese leaders are very, very savvy. Um, they understand that they run basically an authoritative regime, but that as long as the 1.2 billion people are improving their lives every year, 
it's a fairly stable regime. That's all and they so want. If they, they want their produce, standard of living if they to go produce up. the standard of living increases, the food increases, they think there will not be another Tiananmen Square. And they're probably right. So everything they can do to increase the welfare of the, all 1.2 billion people, they're very obsessed on and focused on. And therefore, when they run into someone like Trump who threatens that, they panic a little bit. And you can feel – if you go to China, and several friends of mine have been to China in the last year, you can feel the panic a bit oh, from yes. the top down because they realize there's some instability. And that instability could lead to another Tiananmen Square, which is their worst fear. So I think that some of this will work in his favor. But asking some questions of things we take for granted or at least the Washington establishment has taken for granted, particularly in foreign policy – is a very healthy dynamic of this administration. I think there's a lot of negatives to the administration, yeah. and you know we talked about a few, but I, I think there are some positives. Moving the embassy in Israel was, a, at least in my view, very important to actually say something and deliver on it, yeah. to realize who your friends and who your enemies are, and be able to back that up despite people complaining and whining. So I, I think there's a lot of successes there, but they're marred by so many errors that it makes it hard to have a net positive view. Be sure to catch part two of Jason's action-packed interview with Keith Raboy of Coastal Ventures and PayPal in our next episode of This Week in Startups.